our, our third week of Felling Faith, um, and I titled this message, Full Circle Faith. Full Circle Faith. Now, for some of us, it's unshakable, and for some of us, it's extremely fragile. However, for most of us, we're somewhere in the middle of these two extremes when we talk about our faith. We're somewhere in the middle of being a superhero and being the victim. Somewhere in the middle is where a lot of us live our lives when we talk about our faith. Our faith is flexible and it is as fluid as the next episode in our lives. Sometimes our faith takes us on a journey and we follow it where it leads us. It's our faith that moves us, but often it will take us to a place where we lose it. It moves us, but as it moves, we hesitate to follow. Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever begun to step out on faith? And as you step out on faith, you hesitate when faith continues to move and you stop and you begin to understand, well, well what am I doing? And we enter a dark place. We enter a place of uncertainty. We enter a place that we cannot navigate without the help of faith. Without faith, we cannot move forward. Faith gets us moving only to cause us to pause. If you've never paused in your walk of faith with God, I would venture to say that you've never walked in faith. Because if you've ever walked in faith, you get scared to the core of who you are because faith begins to put you into a place to where you have no control over what's going on and you're operating under the understanding that God is going to be there with you. Once we get to that place and we find that faith again after we hesitated, nobody can ever stop us because we understand what it is to regain that faith. Today we're going to talk about a disciple that everyone knows. Everyone has heard about but no one wants to be in his group. No one wants to be on this disciple's team. Although there are only a few verses, a few scriptures that are spoken about him in the Bible, 11 to be exact, everyone knows Thomas. Everyone knows doubting Thomas. We all know him by that name. Very rarely do we ever speak of Thomas the disciple as Thomas the disciple we always call him Doubting Thomas. Whenever somebody is struggling in their faith and to believe God for the next miracle, to believe God for the next sign, we always say, don't be a Doubting Thomas. We, we say that. But when we take a longer and a deeper look, we find something that a lot of us can identify with. There is a truth about Thomas that is in each and every one of us. If you have your Bibles, we're going to John chapter 20. We're going to read verses 19 through 29. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. If you don't have your, your word, as you know, it will be behind me on the screen. This is what the word of God says. On the evening of that day, that first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of, of any, uh, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the marks on his, uh, in the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples we're inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, 
and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, I have believed, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, God. I pray, God, that you would touch me to speak your word. And I pray, Father, you would touch your people that they would hear your word. Father, let it not be anything other than what you want spoken. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you have done and all that you're doing. We believe that your word is going to transform us today. Father, hide me behind your cross. Let you be seen, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. You know, when you begin to read this, you begin to, to focus on what Thomas says after all of his friends go up to him and, and tell him what they have experienced. Thomas didn't believe the witness of the disciples. He didn't believe his friends because he did not experience it. There's something about experiencing something for you to believe it. It's something about experiencing something so you can explain it to somebody else. You see, it was something that he saw. If you go back and, and read your word, you understand that there's three times within the gospel that Thomas was with Jesus when he rose somebody from the dead. When he went and he rose Jairus' daughter from the dead. He, he called out to Lazarus and Lazarus came forth. He went to the widow's son and, and raised the widow's son. Thomas saw Jesus speak life into dead corpses. And those corpses uh, had to respond to the word of Jesus Christ. He saw the power of Jesus. But now he is living with the experience of seeing his Savior crucified on a cross. Very brutally. He saw his Savior take his last breath. And his head fall. He saw his Savior taken from the cross and put into a grave and the stone rolled in front of the grave. He saw all this. And even though he understood that there was power in the voice of Jesus, power in the words of how could Jesus resurrect himself when Jesus was dead? This was the mindset of Thomas. How can Jesus bring himself back to life? He can't speak to himself. And yet he was told by, by Mary that Jesus had, had risen from the, from the dead. All of them was, was told by this. And for some reason he was not in that room when Jesus came the first time. You see, it gets to my first point. We get caught up and we forget the beginning. You see, when we look at Thomas, we think about John chapter 20 and what I just read. We forget about the life of Thomas because there's not much written about Thomas in the scriptures. If you do a word search, there's exactly, according to my count and my search, 11 verses that speak about Thomas. The only gospel that ever writes anything that was spoken by Thomas is the book of John. Everywhere else, Thomas is recorded in a list of the other disciples. But John writes things that Thomas said. You see... We forget that Thomas wasn't always a failure. Because when you begin, begin to, to really get honest with yourself, that's how you see Thomas. You see Thomas as a failure. He wasn't always a weakling, one of wavering faith. As we talk about Thomas and as we look at Thomas, this is what we jump to, doubting Thomas. But there's more to his story, just like there's more to your story. Because somewhere along your walk with Jesus Christ, you get to the part in John chapter 20 where you become Thomas and you begin to doubt what God has spoken. You begin to doubt what God is doing in the world. You begin to doubt because you're not experiencing it. And your faith becomes weak. Your faith begins to waver. Your faith begins to fail. And you begin to wonder what's going on. You see... Thomas, first and foremost, was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Thomas was handpicked, chosen by Jesus to be one of his disciples, one of his, his students that's going to spread the gospel after Jesus leaves this earth. There was no special scripture. There's no special story. There's nothing that singles him out. 
When you look at Thomas and the first time the name of Thomas is, is written, it's in the list of the disciples. He is part of the disciples. He wasn't called out like Andrew. He wasn't called out like Peter. He wasn't pulled out from the tax booth like Matthew. He was just listed as one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, picked by God himself. But you see, Thomas was not the same person after Jesus Christ called him. There's something about Thomas that Jesus knew. Not that Jesus saw. You know, a lot of us, especially as, as I'm coaching Little League basketball, you can look at individuals, little kids, you know, 11, 12, and 13-year-olds, and you can say, you know what, I see something in them. There's a way they, they handle the ball. There's a way they can dribble or, or the way they have hand-eye coordination. It can control the, I see something in them. And just a little bit of help and we can really make them a great ball player. You see, Jesus didn't see anything in Thomas. Jesus knew there was something inside of Thomas. Jesus knew what the Father had placed in him the same way he knows what he has placed inside of you. Remember, he was in the womb and he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows what's inside of you the same way he knows what's inside of Thomas. Sometimes all it takes is a small move. You know, maybe, maybe as, as we just... Pretend a little bit as, as, as Jesus calls Thomas. Maybe Thomas is, is sitting there on the side of the road and Jesus just looks at him and takes a small step to him. And that's all it took for Thomas to get up and to follow Jesus. Maybe it was just a, a small little whisper. Thomas, I have something for you. Maybe it was just something small. But whatever it was, Thomas was Jesus's from that moment on. He never wavered. He was, the, he was the disciple of Jesus Christ. Thomas was all in. Everything about him was all in. All his strength. All of his weaknesses. All of his questions. You see, we overlook the past stance that Thomas lived. We overlook the past encounters. And we look at only the present thing that we have. The very last thing. And that's what we remember Thomas by. You see, if I go to ask you, hey, do you know the other two occasions in the Word of God where Thomas is so speaking? Can, can you record? Can you re remember what Thomas said? Most of you will probably say, no, but I hope you're going to tell me because I want to go back and read it. Don't worry, I got that for you. I'm going to share it with you in just a moment. But there's something about Thomas. We cannot live in the past. We cannot ignore the past. We cannot act like it has never happened. There can be truth. And there can be evidence in the past. Thomas was Thomas. Jesus Christ's disciple. Ready to deploy when nobody else was. If you go to John chapter 11 verses 7 through 16. But we're only going to read three of those verses. You begin to see an encounter. You begin to see a dialogue between Thomas and Jesus and Thomas and the disciples. John chapter 11 is very famous because this is the chapter where we find Lazarus. Lazarus has already been dead. Lazarus was in the tomb and he was, he was decaying. And Jesus goes up to him. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus begins to tell them how, how Lazarus is sick and they don't want to go back there because the Jews are trying to kill Jesus for all Jesus is doing. And we drop down to verse 7. And he says, then after this, he spoke to his disciples. Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just speaking to stone you. Are you going there again? Wait a second, Jesus. I understand who you are. I understand what you can do. But let me tell you something. As a spokesperson for all disciples, Peter, I don't think it's a good idea for you to go back to Judea because I know what they're trying to do. And I know that you're powerful, but I don't know if you've ever been hit by one of them stones before. I don't know if you've ever been hit by four of those stones before, but it gets kind of bad when they begin to hit you with those stones. I've seen it. Jesus said, we're going back because Lazarus needs me. And then you drop all the way down to verse 16. 
And you begin to see something in Thomas that you don't see in the other disciples. You begin to see something in Thomas that you don't see in John chapter 20. Verse 16 said, so Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. We may be walking into harm. We may be walking into some place where nobody's going to welcome us. But let me tell you something. If my Jesus is going over there, I want to go with him. If they're going to take his life, they're going to take my life right alongside of him. You might want to stay here. But let me, let me encourage you. Let us follow him into Judea. Let us go to where he's going. Let me, let me speak up just a moment. You might not like it. You might not agree with it. But if Jesus said it, there is something to be had in Judea and I refuse to stay in any place where he is not and I will follow him wherever he goes. You see, we don't, we don't see Thomas this way. We see Thomas as the weakling. We see Thomas as the doubter. We see Thomas as the one that failed Jesus. But as you begin to see, there is something inside of Thomas. Thomas was willing to go whatever and whenever Jesus went, when everyone else was afraid, Thomas stood up and said, I'm going with Jesus. Well, you could jump down to John 14 and you begin to, to look at another conversation that Thomas had. And, and this began to, 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 to do something inside of my spirit. John chapter 14, we're going to start at verse 1 and go to 5. This is what it says. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus speaking. Believe in God, also believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If, if it were not so, would I have told you that I would go prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That where I am, you will also be. And you know the way. And he goes to verse 5. And Thomas, I see, begin to, you ever had that? Somebody begin to talk to you, and as they begin to talk to you, all of a sudden your mind just clicks on. And before you realize it, your mind's going and going and going, and you don't even hear half the conversation that they're saying because your mind is just going and going and going. And I can just see Thomas as the wheels just are spinning. They're in overdrive. They're, they're burning rubber in his head. Wait, wait, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Jesus Christ is talking about he's about to leave us. He's about to go somewhere that we're not going to be able to go right now, but he's going to come back and get us. And he said that he, he's prepared a place, and if he's prepared a place, he'll come back. But wait a second. What are we going to do in the, in the, in, what are we going to do in the meantime when he's not here? What are we going to do? And Thomas says, Lord, we didn't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And it shows me that Thomas says, wait a second, Jesus. I've given you my life. And wherever you're going, I want to be right there. I don't want you to leave me for one second, Jesus. I don't want you to go away without me, Jesus. I want to be right there where you are, Jesus. All the other disciples are kind of sitting back. And now you see Thomas pleading. We all say Andrew and John and the one, the beloved. That, but I see there's something inside of Thomas that we overlook. Because all we do is jump to the end of his story and see where he doubted God. To see where he doubted Jesus and the reports of his friends. But I see something else in Thomas that I believe that every one of us can relate to. Yes, we have failed God. Yes, our faith has wavered. Yes, our faith has failed us. Or we have failed our faith. But there's something on the inside side that we can say today without a shadow of a doubt I will give my life for Jesus Christ because he has already given his life for me I mean where, what else can we do is there another disciple in the scriptures that, that more looks like us Americans come on now we ain't like the people over in the third world countries we're not like the ones that had to live through persecution we're persecuted when Facebook takes down our post we're persecuted when Twitter says we can't tweet that no more. We're persecuted when all this stuff happens. We can't uh, utilize social media the way we want to utilize social media. They take down the picture of the cross because it's offensive. It's persecution. We have no idea what persecution is all about. We don't know what it is. But what about those that are in those other countries that understand what it is? Those that have to, to walk by, the, by the, 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 the shield of night and the cloak of night because if somebody saw them, their lives will be taken from them. 
Thomas said, I don't care where we go, Jesus. I don't care if they're coming for you or not. I'm going to be right where you are. And Jesus, I don't want you to go anywhere without me. I understand you've got a promise for me. I understand you've got something great for me. But, but I don't want any. I want you, Jesus. I want to be where you are. So many times we get so caught up in what Jesus has in his hand for us. But I don't want anything in his hands. All I want to do is see the nail scars and understand that he is my Savior. Understand that no matter where he goes, I'm going to go. I want everybody in this world to understand that you might reject him. You might not have the strength to stand up. But he is the only thing I want in this world. He is the only thing that's ever going to stand fast. He is the only thing that will ever be completely faithful to us. It is Jesus. I don't care the house that you might have for me. I want you, Lord. I think about that old song, and I, 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 I can't. When we go over there, I remember Michael Inglis saw it, and, and it talks about how you saw Peter and John and all this, and he says, hey, I, I don't want to see none of you. I want to see my Jesus. When I get to heaven, mama, I love you. Grandmama, I love you. But you know what? I got here for another reason. I want you to step out of my way. I want to see the one that let me get here in the first place. I want to see the one that gave his life for me. And it doesn't matter if your faith fails every now and then. Thomas, his faith failed. But as it did, he stood there. And he stood there. And he waited. And he waited. He didn't go anywhere. You see, it's easy. It's easy for his friends to say, hey, Jesus was here. Jesus was here. I saw, his, I saw the scars. I put my hands in his side. It was him. He was alive. We saw him. Why didn't I see him? Why didn't I experience that? See, we don't know. The, the scriptures do not tell us why Thomas was not with him at that moment. We don't understand what, what pulled Thomas away. But for some reason, Jesus is the reason. For some reason, he was not there. Thomas questioned Jesus in John chapter 14 because he wanted to know. He, he wanted to believe and he wanted to be strong. You can see it and you can feel it. Thomas wanted to be everywhere Jesus was. He did not want to be separated from him. If Jesus was leaving, Thomas wanted to know how to get back to him. I don't know about you, but you ever had to go on a long work trip? I can imagine how Jose and them were when they had to leave the church and go back to Honduras or or when they made the decision to leave Honduras and to come here, how, how they understood that there's going to be a great separation from those that he loved. And, and for one instance, he's not going to be able to see these people that he loved. And in the other instance, he's not going to be able to see these people that he loved. I could just imagine what was going through Thomas's mind. As he says, my Jesus is going to leave and he's going to come back, but he didn't say when. You see, that leads me to my, my second point. Past experiences are not future victories. When you look at the life of Thomas, we can see that. That past experiences do not give us future victories. Thomas showed us that we cannot get we cannot get us to where we want to go. We cannot get to what will be when we lose sight of who it's all about. I don't care what you experienced in the past, but you cannot get to where you're supposed to be in the future if you lose sight of Jesus Christ. I don't care what revival you've been a part of. I don't care what ministry you've been a part of. When you lose sight of him, you lose sight of the future. Just because of the experiences that filled Thomas's life, he had to move past what he saw, what he saw was holding him back. He had to move past what he knew. He had to shift from what was him to what is him. Thomas entered the same carousel we did. And as he did, Jesus spoke in John 14, chapter 1. We already read it. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. Believe in me also. You see, first we have to make a, 
make it a resounding clear that as all matters of truth and understanding, intelligent questioning and searching are essential to faith. Faith is not taking something just because somebody said it. Faith is not taking something and just believing it because somebody else believed it. But we have to question. And that question has to lead us closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Faith is not a crutch. It's not a comfort blanket for the fearful. On the contrary, on the contrary faith requires true courage. To have faith is to live in the presence of mystery. Sometimes conforming, often challenging, but never complacent. In our lives, there are constant battles, and we see that in Thomas. The enemy will distract us and pull us as much as we let him. Notice how I worded that. He will pull us as much as we let him. How much are you allowing the enemy to pull you away from what God's calling you? How much are you allowing the enemy to pull you away from what God wants to do in your life? He will get you to rely on those sight instead of the words of Jesus Christ. Thomas found himself in a dry season. He found himself in a blind spot. What was happening before had stopped and he was in trouble. Think about what was happening in Thomas' life. He was walking with Jesus. He was hearing the tone of his voice. He was seeing the gentle touch of his hands as he laid his hands on people and prayed. He was seeing all of this. And now that was gone. And now he's in a dry spot. Have you ever been in a dry spot? Are you sitting in a dry spot right now? Are, are you trying to figure out, God, what's going on? I haven't felt anything. I haven't seen anything. I haven't had any revelation forever. What is going on in my life, God? Maybe you're on that carousel right now with Thomas. And Thomas was on that carousel. And he went from a faith to, to questioning. Faith to questioning. And it never said that he turned away from God. See, Thomas, his struggle was not alone. There's a funny thing. If you go into the scriptures, you find a lot of the powerhouses in scripture had the same battle Thomas did. I've got a couple for you. John the Baptist. Wait a second. John doubted? Scripture says he did. He didn't say he doubted. We don't say doubting John. But what we do say is this. He saw Jesus Christ coming from afar, and he said, there is the Son of God. There is the Lamb of God. There's somebody coming. I can't even strap his, his shoes, and there he is. I baptized him, and the Spirit came down on him like a dove, and I heard the Father say, there's my beloved Son. And then we find John in prison, and he asked his disciples, as he was in prison, he questioned if that was really the Messiah. And he says, disciples, go to him. Ask him, the one that I baptized, where I saw the Spirit come down, and I understand that it's God's Son. Ask him if he is the Messiah, the one that is to come. I'm in prison right now. I'm kind of doubting what's going on. I've kind of got a battle going on on the inside. I, I need to find out for sure. John the Baptist had the same thing that we have right now. There are times in our lives we don't understand why God allows it to happen, but he does. And when it happens and it happens and it happens, we begin to question what's going on in our life. And we begin to question God. And as we do, we become like John the Baptist, who was on the same team as Thomas, the doubting disciple. John the Baptist was the same. What about Simon Peter? Simon Peter cut the ears off of a guard. And he went into the, the, court, the courtyard and denied Jesus Christ three times. The one that the church is, is now is, is being put on, the one that, that was now being the biggest evangelist of the world at the time after, the, after Acts chapter 2, here it was. Peter, John the Baptist, and Thomas are all fighting for first string on the doubting team. They're all together. Well, wait a second, I don't understand. How about Elijah? Elijah. The powerful prophet of God that was on the mountaintop with fire coming down. He comes from the fire on top of the mountain down into the drought of the valley to be taken home in a chariot of fire. All because there was a roller coaster in the carousel that he went on. He saw God move. God began to quit moving so much. And he began to doubt God and everything. And Elijah said, God, take my life. 
This woman's going to kill me, take my life. And Elijah went on to mentor Elisha. And God takes him away because even though his faith was rocked, it stayed where it was supposed to stay. Oh, and my favorite, Moses. There's not a bigger doubter in the Bible than Moses. Every time he turned around, he was asking God for another sign. Every time he was turning around, he was asking God, God, do something else. God, what are you going to do? Well, I've already prayed the Red Sea. Yeah, but they need water. We'll hit the rock. Oh, I don't want to do that. What then? Don't, don't I have manna for you every single morning? Isn't there quail ready for you to pick up and eat as much as you want? What else do you need me to do? I showed you sign after sign after sign. Can I have one more? I'm on the team with Thomas. I'm on the team with John. I'm here with Elijah. We need one more sign. And see, that's where we are. Most of us are right there. We're ready for that one more sign. One more sign. Faith is not walking without doubt and questions. Faith is continuing even those, those companions are on your back. Faith is seeking the answers that can only be found in Jesus Christ. You see, my last point is simply this. Just like Thomas, Jesus sees you. You may doubt. You may not understand, but he sees you. Psalms 30, 139.7 says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? It goes on to say it doesn't matter how high you get, how low you get, wherever you are, my presence and my spirit is right there. I don't care what you feel right now. God's presence is all in this place. I don't care what you're going through right now. God is in the middle of your situation, ready to touch and to change your life. All you have to do is be willing to listen to what he's saying. Jesus came to Thomas. When you begin to go back to our text, Jesus knew the struggle going on in Thomas' mind. He knew the battle that Thomas was facing. Thomas didn't give up. Thomas didn't quit. Thomas didn't run away. Well, Jesus didn't show himself to me. I'm going to another team. Jesus didn't show himself to me. I'm going somewhere else. The Bible says that later on that he was in the same room with the disciples the same way it was when Jesus appeared the first time to the disciples. It was eight days later. And I began to think last night, God, why did you wait eight days? Why did you wait eight days? What is significant about the wait of eight days? I'm glad you asked me that question. I think I might have an answer for you. Because when you begin to look at the meaning of numbers in Scripture, eight is powerful. Eight is something that would just make you run and jump and shout. You see, it was eight days later. He didn't have all the answers, but Thomas was still there. Eight days later. I can imagine that after the disciples told him what was going on, and Andrew was like, hey, I saw him, man. I don't know what's wrong with you. He showed me himself. Day one goes by and says, okay, well, Jesus is going to show up. Right? That's how we all are. Or that first day of revival, or that, that first day of this. Okay, I, I didn't get anything out of this service, but the next one I'm going to get something for me. And so he came back the next service. Thomas came back the next day. Okay, Jesus is going to show up. No, didn't show up second day either. And it goes on for eight days. He didn't have all of the boxes checked, but Thomas was still there. He possibly didn't have the pep in his step like the other disciples did, but he was still there. You see, he remained steadfast. He remained resilient, even though he did not have the answers that he sought. He remained resilient. You see, the meaning of the number eight in Scripture is simply this. The number eight stands for a new beginning. The number eight stands for a new life. It stands for regeneration. It stands for a resurrection. You see, Thomas believed Jesus was invincible, but he saw Jesus die on the cross. How things affect us will not happen if we don't see it. But as he was waiting on the eighth day in that room, the Bible says the doors were shut, the doors were locked, and they were in the room. And all of a sudden, Jesus appeared out of nowhere. There he was in the middle. 
middle of the situation, in the middle of the room, with his disciple, with his heart broke because he had not seen his Savior on the eighth day when there was a new life that was going to be given, when there was a resurrection of a spirit that was going to come inside of a man, when a man was going to be regenerated on the inside like never before. Jesus said, you wanted to see my wounds? Here they are. You want to touch them? Touch them, Thomas. Touch them. I died for you, Thomas. I rose for you, Thomas. I'm here for you, Thomas. Thomas, I don't care how you doubt it. I don't care why you question. But let me tell you something. On the eighth day, it ain't the third day, but on the eighth day, I showed myself to you to give you a new life, to regenerate your spirit, and to show you that I care and that I see you. You see, we think about Thomas in John chapter 20. We don't think about Thomas once the Bible closes and how his life ended up. You see, Thomas was one of the strongest disciples after this moment. When you begin to go look, you begin to see that, that in Acts chapter 1, what do we find? Thomas? That's right, in another list with the disciples, all of them in the upper room. That's right, I said he was in the upper room, and they shut that door because they was in one mind and one accord. And Jesus says, do not leave until that promise is given to you. And he walked with the disciples and said, hey, babies, let's go. Let's shut that door. We're going to shut it, and we're going to stay here no matter how long we have to stay here. It took me eight days to see him resurrected. I don't care if i got to stay here the rest of my life. He said, don't leave until the promise comes, and I'm going to stay right here. Here. Oh, we read about Acts chapter 3 when Peter steps out and he witnesses and 3,000 come to the church. We don't see about Thomas because there's something else on the inside of Thomas. And he leaves that area and goes far and he goes all the way to India planting churches. Nobody ever said anything about Thomas doubting again because he went to the far ends of the earth and said, I'm going to take my Jesus everywhere. I might have, have questioned, I might, my spirit might have been broken for a moment, but I understand who he is. I understand what he can do. I understand what he has placed on the inside of me, and I refuse. I refuse to push anybody else down, and I'm going to take his word wherever I have to go. So my question to you is simply this. Thank you for watching. We hope today's message has inspired and transformed. You see, there was a full circle faith. You read about Thomas, strong, full of faith, ready to take on the world. Things don't quite happen the way he wants to, and that fire gets put out just a little bit. Now we're down at the bottom of the circle. And all of a sudden, on that eighth day, somebody say eighth day. Yeah. On that eighth day, there was something that happened to Thomas that nobody, no matter what they said, no matter what they do, nobody could ever take it away. And I'm telling you right now, all it takes is one encounter. You've heard me say that before. But all it takes is one true encounter with the Holy One. And nobody will ever be able to take you away from that. Nobody will ever take that away from you. And nobody will ever be able to shake your faith. Because you understand that God stopped everything that he was doing. And he spoke to you one on one the same way he did Thomas. You see, what's wrong with the world today is we want it right now. We want it right now. We don't want to be resilient. We don't want to be steadfast. We don't want to wait in the moment. We don't want to do We want it right now. But let me tell you something. If Jesus waited eight days, he had a reason to wait eight days. But he sees you. Whatever situation you're in, whatever door's closed, whatever's locked, he can get in. No matter what you're going through. He can get there. He's been waiting. Derek, if you'll come play softly, please. You see, Thomas is one of these guys that, as I try to do today, they get a bad rap. Hopefully I change your, your mind about who Thomas was. Thomas wasn't this weakling that... that that gave up because he didn't get what he wanted. Thomas was a disciple that was so in love with Jesus Christ that he couldn't believe that Jesus didn't show himself the same time he showed himself to the other disciples. And he was broken because he wanted to be with his Savior. Jesus, I don't care where you go. Just make sure I'm, I'm, your, I'm on your coattail. Jesus, look around and make sure I'm following you. If I'm not, hit me upside my head. Turn my head the right way. And you see, some of us, all jokes aside, need to be hit upside our head every now and then. 
We need that holy hit to get our focus back on the cross of Jesus Christ. To get our focus back. I want to pray for you today. If this message was for you, you know it was. If it wasn't, you know it wasn't. But I want to pray for you today that that if you're doubting in your walk with Jesus Christ, that you can leave today knowing that you can have the reassurance that he's here.